Breathing is at the heart of what it means to be a living human. We don't usually think about it much because breathing is an autonomic function and happens without us even really thinking about it at all. Similarly, when we inhale cannabis, we spend a lot more time choosing our favorite strain and smoking or vaping device than we do thinking about the role our lungs play in this process. Because cannabis is a bronchial dilator, many who use cannabis think that means that cannabis cannot injure or impact our lungs, and that's simply not true. It's wishful thinking for us to think that whatever we inhale will be fine so long as it's cannabis. The reality is far more complex than that. Inhaling cannabis can help lungs in many ways for sure, but there's also methods that negatively impact the lungs as well. Not only that, if you are toking on a budget, there are definitely ways to smoke that are more effective at getting you high with less flour or oil. Common myths about cannabis in the lungs are easily spread while hanging out with friends, smoking bowls, or even easier over the internet, but that does not make them true. There are proven and well-established health insights about breathing that can improve your use of cannabis, whether it be for health or fun. If you want to learn about cannabis health, business, and technique efficiently and with good cheer, I encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter. We'll send you new podcast episodes as they come out, delivered right into your inbox, along with commentary on a couple of the most important news items from the week and videos too. Don't rely on social media to let you know when the new episode is published. Sign up for the updates to make sure you don't miss an episode. Also, starting this month, we will be giving away very cool prizes to folks who are signed up to receive the newsletter. There's nothing else you need to do to win except sign up and receive the newsletter. For April, I'm really stoked that we are giving away several newly released AirVape X vaporizers from AirVapeUSA.com. I'll be talking about those more later in the show, but for now, go to ShapingFire.com to sign up for the newsletter and be entered into all future newsletter prize drawings. You are listening to Shaping Fire, and I'm your host, Shango Los. My guest this week is Robert Littman. For over 30 years, Robert Littman has guided clients and students in the use of movement, breath, and sound as a tool for personal growth and efficient body mechanics. He co-developed the Well Springs Practitioner Program with Emily Conrad, founder of Continuum Movement, and co-taught with her for 18 years. He was on the faculty of Continuum Movement until 2014 and has made many contributions to Continuum's practices, particularly in the sciences, incorporating respiratory physiology, neuroanatomy, and cellular biology. Robert has been a faculty member and head of the Departments of Anatomy and Physiology and Movement Education at the Desert Institute of the Healing Arts Massage School. He teaches the Buteco breathing technique, helping people with a variety of disorders, and is also an organizing member, registered educator, and trainer of the Buteco Breathing Educators Association. Robert has advanced certifications in the Duggan French approach and somatic pattern recognition and a graduate certification as a breathing behavior analyst. He's also a specialist in breathing and the use of etheogenic psychoactive substances. He founded his practice, uh, personal practice, The Breathable Body, in 2003 and regularly leads classes and workshops worldwide. Welcome to the show, Robert. Well, thank you. Good morning to you. So before we get into the mechanics of breathing, I, I want to set the tone correctly for this show because, you know, it's important for folks to get that you are very integrative and holistic in your practice. And, you know, I've already described your practice in the introduction, but would you set the context for us by explaining how cannabis inhalation can increase our awareness of breathing and, and the body as a whole towards the general betterment of everybody who tokes cannabis? Cannabis. Yeah, one of the things that I have played with and discovered for myself as well as for my clients is that cannabis increases body awareness. When I say body awareness, is our ability to be able to sense what is going on inside of our bodies, sort of like an animal does, you know, is operating from their senses. And when we operate from our senses, we're more in touch with how breathing is actually moving inside of our organism. And by, able, by being able to sense that and feel into how our lungs open, how our body spreads out when we breathe in and how it comes back into its normal shape when we breathe out, we're able to then have better access to using our breath to soothe our nervous system and to let the cannabis and its bronchodilating effects open up our airways. And so I like that particular piece of the awareness that gets included in smoking cannabis or taking it in other forms. And so that when we learn that about ourselves, even when we are not using cannabis, we're able to implement what we've learned just throughout the day to help soothe our nervous system and any kind of breathing disorders that we may have. 
that cannabis can support. So I know we're going to be talking a lot about the relationship between uh, ca- uh, cannabis, breathing, and anxiety today. Can you break out just a little bit um, how breathing is interacts with the nervous system? Uh, and, and so the, the mechanism, by the way, it even has the ability to soothe us? Well, when we relax, when we're, you know, cannabis can have any effect of relaxing you. You tend to breathe from a deeper place within inside of your body. It's more down in the lower belly, your diaphragm, and it's more active in breathing, which sets the tone for the nervous system to recognize that we're not on fight or flight, that it's a time for the body to be in a more parasympathetic mode of relaxation. When we're anxious, we tend to breathe up high in our chest, which is a much smaller space. And so that's sending a message to our nervous system that we're in, something is threatening us, and so that we're in fight or flight. And when we're in fight or flight, we're breathing way too fast. And usually in the case of people who are anxious and not moving quickly, fight or flight, there's a mismatch. And so there's a lot of adrenaline running through the system, but we're not moving. So the body gets anxious, thinks what's happening, where's the threat, and what am I supposed to do about it right in this particular moment? So the mind gets really active in that regard. If we were really in fight or flight and running for our life, there would be no mind involved. So if cannabis has this ability to, if it can for you, soften the nervous surf, soften the nervous system, soften your breathing, relax the body so that you're breathing more from your diaphragm and more uh, with ease and at a slower pace. That's the biggest issue too, is breathing at a slower pace. When we're really anxious or if we're having an asthma attack, we'll tend to breathe 20 to 30 times per minute. Normal breathing rate is about 12 to 14 times, maybe even eight to 12 breathing uh, breaths per minute. And when we're really in parasympathetic parasympathetic mode and really relaxed, we're breathing around six breaths per minute. And so that's that's the learning that we're looking for as to how to establish both the pace and the rhythm of breathing and also the volume of breathing, that we're breathing less per minute than we are that if we're in fight or flight. And that's a big issue right there, which we can talk about in a few more minutes, why that's so important. That's really interesting. And, you know, uh, even though I, I didn't just toke, the fact that you and I are talking about breathing is increasing the awareness of my breath, which which now I'm doing it with more awareness and I notice it's slowing down. And, you know, I'm excited because we're doing the recording, but I've just calmed myself down just by listening to you talk about <laughs> healthy breathing. So, so uh, you know, awareness is everything. So so let's talk about now the, the actual mechanics, right? We all take breathing for um, for granted, um, but but there are right ways and wrong ways to do it, and 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 our body actually has to do several things for us to successfully breathe. Thank goodness that it's on autopilot. So so um, so we can unpack this later on when we're talking about some of the challenges. Would you explain the mechanics of of inhalation? The mechanics of inhalation. Thank you. That's a really clear question. Well, when we breathe in the inhalation, the diaphragm is descending. That's the, that's the major breathing muscle that is right down at the lower ribs. And when the diaphragm moves properly and lowers down towards your pelvis, it's increasing the size of your lungs. It's stretching the bottom of the lungs. That's the first stage. The second stage is the ribs on the side, if you had your hands on the side of your ribs, they will start to elevate, and that begins to take the lungs in a width. It's opening up the lungs to be wider. In a really full and big breath when you need a lot more air, then the front of the chest will move, which will increase the dimension of the lung front to back. So the function of that is to change the internal pressure of the lungs. So when the lungs are fully closed and we're at the end of the exhale, the pressure inside the lung is less than the pressure outside in the atmosphere, which is surprising, but it is true. And so when the lungs begin to open up by the pull of the diaphragm and the ribs, the pressure outside of the body is greater than the pressure inside because the space is expanding. And so what happens automatically is air is drawn into the lungs. It's almost like you say, we don't even have to think about it, but because of the pressure changes in physics, it wants to move from a higher pressure gradient to a lower pressure gradient. So lung, the air is coming into the lungs to equalize the pressure both outside and inside. 
And so our lungs fill automatically, which is what happens when we're sleeping. We're not thinking about it, which is one of the amazing things about breathing, that it's both under our control and it happens automatically. That's probably a really healthy fail safe for our human that as as we exhale, there's like an automatic bounce back to inhaling again. Um, that, that makes evolutionary sense to me. Yeah, well, there is a fail safe. It's like, it's like people who faint, you know, a lot, a lot of people have uh, experiences of like getting up to speak, say, or being on a radio show where they get anxious and they start to breathe too fast and they begin to hyperventilate and they get dizzy and they pass out. Well, that's the fail safe right there. You can't uh, kill yourself by breathing too much. You'll end up fainting. And the mechanism of fainting, of course, is that when you're fainted, your body will go back to breathing uh, at a rate that is actually commensurate for what the body needs. And so um, you're back, you're coming back to normal that way. Right on. That makes sense. Yeah. So as somebody with lifelong asthma, I've always thought that inhaling cannabis would be bad for the lungs because of the resin collecting on the lung cilia inside and, and gooping those up. And also, I always expected the throat and the lung to be irritated from the heat. Um, but, you know... I got laughed at on a lot of social media threads about that belief. And so I, I, I read more and more about it. And it does seem that I'm wrong. And the more studies that I read about, um, you know, tobacco inhalation, marijuana inhalation, you know, whether it's dabbing or joints, they all seem to suggest that overall inhaling cannabis is good for the lungs. How can that be so? Why isn't inhaling uh, cannabis smoke c coating our lungs with additional resin and making things worse? Well, one of the things you have to speak about first is, is, is how much are you going to smoke at one time, how much you're taking in, what kind of volume, and what kind of heat it's at. So in terms of asthma, there are strains and that are bronchodilators. There's um, many, there's actually, I'm, in my own reading too, there are six ways that cannabis actually helps helps the lungs, but we have to be careful about how much you smoke and how much uh, how much heat is in the smoke, because when you know there's too much heat in the smoke, you're coughing, which is actually a reaction to kind of push out what got in there that doesn't need to be in there. So we're looking at other effects of it in terms of microdosing cannabis. We're looking at anti-inflammatories, antibacterial, bronchial dilation, and anti-spasmatic, and it's an allergesic. It helps with the pain. So it, the, the bronchial dilating effect is the most important because with asthma, that's what happens when you're starting to have an asthma attack. The smooth muscle in the airways is contracting in a way that doesn't allow the air to be released. So cannabis offers that effect where it hits the smooth muscle and it relaxes it to let the airflow begin again. So I think in terms of what you're talking about in terms of the resins, it just really depends on how much you smoke because most of the readings and most of the studies that have been done with cannabis are about small doses. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so that's interesting that, that really there's a threshold point where the, the regularity of smoking cannabis switches over from being um, necessarily healthy for the lungs to actually being potentially detrimental. And, and of course, you know, I'm sure that everybody like me is wondering how do we know where that point is? And I'm assuming that it's different for every person, but do we really only know where our threshold is when we reach it and we start experiencing negative side effects from too much smoke inhalation? Yeah, that's my experience. My experience is the fact that um, the smoke and the resin, so let's talk about mucus. So the lungs have this ability to make mucus. And so you can, you know, you start to expectorate, you start to notice that you have a little bit more mucus and that you're coughing up. So why is that mucus being produced in the first place? It's being produced to protect the lungs. Something is irritating the lungs beyond what they normally need, and the body's making more mucus to cover it up uh, and to help it move out because the mucus is meant to either be swallowed or coughed up. So my experience is when I start to feel like I've got more mucus in my body, I know that I'm smoking too much and that uh, I'm putting too many irritants into my lungs. 
That actually makes a lot of uh, sense too, because, you know, people in cannabis, you know, often will joke about, you know, the, the mucus or feeling chunky after, you know, after a big session. And, and, and I myself, you know, when I go to full weekend, you know, cannabis events that are more party than convention, like, uh, like Emerald Cup down in Sonoma County, at the end of Emerald Cup, by the time I'm driving home, um, you know, I feel like, I feel like there's been a, a, you know, a war zone in my lungs or something, <laughs> you know, they feel, they feel sore and tired. And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and that is from, you know, successive joints with friends and colleagues at the event because, you know, certainly my usage goes up at, at something like that. So that makes sense. Um, you so, know, you know, you said, so, excuse me for interrupting, yeah. but you said something really important there. It's like the sore and been overused, you know, there's a, the, we are so, um, let's see, what's the word I want to use here? You know, so unaware is the best word I can come up with at the moment about how our lungs are really taking care of us. I mean, they are the most essential thing we do. Yes, we could talk about our heart being very essential, but the way the heart runs, of course, is that it has to receive the oxygen that the lungs bring in. So it's a rule of three. You can go three minutes without breath three days without water, three weeks without food. It is the most essential process that our body goes through. And we take it for granted most of the time so that when our lungs are feeling sore and feeling tired, it's a time that we can say to ourselves, you know, you got your lungs, you, our lungs, they've been taking care of us for a really long time here. How about I slow down, relax, let my body breathe in a quiet way. Let me take care of my lungs for a while. Right on. So bef before we go to the break, and, and in our second set, we're going to talk a lot about uh, vaporizers and the difference between that and smoke. But um, I want to hit one more moment on um, uh, different warning signs, or, or at least like little yellow flags that people can look for. Um, you mentioned mucus, which uh, uh, I'm sure is maybe even the most prevalent one. But but when somebody is you know new to cannabis. Um, and they don't have the experience of years and years of it, like like many folks do. You know what what things can they look for to let them know that um, they they may be reaching their outside threshold of inhalation, and so maybe need to start considering you know tinctures and other other less inhale inhaled cannabis. Well, it's interesting about what, what the other thing that drives um, the other thing that drives breathing is the ratio between carbon dioxide and oxygen in the system. And most of the time, we think about that oxygen is the nutrient and carbon dioxide is the waste gas. And actually, the truth of that is that carbon dioxide regulates the distribution of oxygen in our bodies. So when I talked about hyperventilating, the reason we faint is because the carbon dioxide levels get so low because we're blowing it out all the time that the oxygen distribution to the brain uh, slows down and we faint. So it's the same thing with smoking too much cannabis. You're, if you're, especially if you're exhaling big exhales, you're disrupting the blood gases in your body. So you can start to get headaches. You can start to get tingling in your hands and feet. You can start to feel your blood pressure rise, your heart rate increase. And those are signs that perhaps you're exhaling too much. And so, and you may be exhaling a lot through your mouth. So you could think about exhaling through your nose, but those would be some of the signs that you're, you're overdoing. Dehydration would be another one. Um, so those are, those are some of the signs because you're disrupting the blood gases. Wow, that's that's really interesting. So so based on that, would it be a safe to say rule of thumb that taking more smaller hits is going to be better for our lungs than taking monster bravado hits? Yes, and you know it, it's also changed. We used to think that we had to hold the air, the smoke in our lungs, and that's that's been proven inaccurate. Now we don't need to do that holding of a breath, which does cause the breathing rate to get disturbed. Now we can breathe in small small amounts, let it come in, and then put it right out, as well as taking it into your mouth first, and then letting it cool there, and then going into the lungs rather than taking it right into the lungs. So yes, smaller hits are much more preferable than really big hits. 
uh, I'm glad you brought up that that myth because you know there's a lot of people. I mean, even even I, I I've believed that for you know 20 some years that that you take the hit and I want to hold it as long as I can because I'm thinking that it's it's soaking into my lungs and I want all the cannabinoids to soak into my lungs and then and then if I could I just want to you know exhale clear because I've got it all now you know and 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 I know that that's wrong but I don't know why that's wrong what what is wrong with that understanding of how um, the cannabinoids are taken in in the lungs that I don't have to hold my breath yeah so the one thing is the fact of what happens to the breathing rate and the and the the rhythm of the breath it gets disrupted by holding your breath and that that pattern can carry over into real life but it's also keeping the smoke in the lungs too long that's where the that's where the damage can be done by the smoke is having it be circulating inside the lungs for too long a length of time it just needs to come in absorb what it needs to absorb and and release it i see so the the fallacy and the thinking is that um uh an, an infinite amount of cannabinoids can be uh, absorbed through the lungs in any particular breath. When the reality is, is that um, if you just take a you know a small to medium sized hit, uh, breathe it in, the the capacity for the lungs to intake cannabinoids is going to be hit its limits, and then you exhale, and that's great. But if you take a bigger hit and you hold it for longer you're actually causing damage without actually any increased benefit because your lungs can fill themselves up with all the you know cannabinoids that a can take in just with a simple small hit yes it's wow. a couple of things couple yes a couple of things one is that a red red blood cells line up singularly as they travel through the lungs and it takes three quarters of a second for a red blood cell to pick up the oxygen and then whatever else it's going to pick up from the lungs so it's on its way in three quarters of a second the other piece of so you can imagine that the parades going it's the, the bloodstream is very available to pick up what's ever in there the other piece of that is that if you start holding your holding your breath with the air in there you're overstretching like a rubber band that's getting used too much in its stretched position and so eventually it's a possibility if you're smoking and holding it for long periods of time you could be dam doing damage to the elasticity of the lungs Wow, that's really interesting. All mm -hmm. right, cool. So uh, after the break, we're going to start talking about uh, vaporizers. Uh, so uh, we're going to take that short break and be right back. You're listening to Shaping Fire, and my guest today is breathing specialist Robert Littman. Join me at the upcoming CanMed event in Los Angeles for a gathering of the top minds in cannabis medicine. Field experts will present their latest findings and best practices in treating a variety of conditions with cannabis, including epilepsy, pain, traumatic brain injury, cancer, autism, and more. Laboratory professionals will share their revolutionary technologies in cannabinoid and terpenoid extraction, delivery methods, and quality and safety testing. CanMed 2018 is October 22nd through 24th at the Luskin Conference Center at UCLA. And while the final speakers list is still coming together, the speakers who are already announced give you plenty of reasons to get your ticket today. Prepare yourself to learn from 54 thought leader presentations focused on furthering the convergence of medical cannabis research, treatment, and product development. Speakers include the father of cannabis research, Raphael Meshulam. Michael Dorr, Chief Medical Consultant for the Israeli Ministry of Health, will be there too. The list of esteemed speakers participating is long and includes Shaping Fire guests, cannabis neuroscientist Dr. Ethan Russo, and Kevin McKiernan of Medicinal Genomics. You can view all the speakers at canmedevents.com. This year's CanMed features a special education track on the application of blockchain technology in the cannabis market, including cannabis banking, seed-to-sale tracking, sequencing the cannabis genome, ICO financing, and more. If you are a medical care provider, be sure to arrive a day early to participate in the pre-conference CME course. Find out more about that at canmedevents.com. That's C-A-N-N-M-E-D events.com. 95% of attendees said CanMed 2017 met or exceeded their expectations. That's a serious vote of confidence that CanMed 2018 will be well worth your time and resources. Shaping Fire listeners can save 20% off the ticket price by purchasing before June 21st and using the discount code SHANGO. So don't delay. Visit CanMedEvents.com today to reserve your seat and find out more. 
Because I often mention that I have asthma on Shaping Fire, I get emails from folks asking me what vaporizers I recommend. Now, certainly there's a wide range of interesting vapes on the market, but since this episode is all about breathing today, I'm going to take a moment and tell you about the two vapes and one filter that I use pretty much every day. The most luxurious vaporizer I have is the Vape Exhale. It's considered a desktop vaporizer, but it's also easy to travel with in a padded case. It plugs into the wall, and because of that, it gets up to temperature very fast. Not only is that great for just not waiting around, but it packs enough power to give a really solid, satisfactory dab hit. The Vape Exhale can use either flour or dab oil. For flour, you grind up the material and drop it in a basket and you place that basket in the base. For dab oil, you place your dab in a borosilicate or quartz tube and then you drop that into the base. Because it's a wall-plugged home appliance, you'll get hits of flour and dab unlike any of you've ever had before, especially from a vaporizer. In fact, I sold my e-nail after my first month having a vape exhale. I just knew I was never going to use it again. So I let the folks at Vape Exhale know ahead of time that I was going to mention their device on the show today, and they sent up a discount code for you to receive 10% off. Just type in shaping fire as one word at checkout. And you know, 10% off actually matters when buying a serious device like this. So make sure to use it. The website is Vape Exhale. The E on the front of exhale is dropped. So it's just vapeexhale.com. And you know, even in a padded travel case though, sometimes the vape exhale is bigger than I want. Sometimes when I'm like hiking or going to a show or whatever, I need something for my pocket. For that, I use my Air Vape X. This is the latest model from airvapeusa.com. You know, I had their last version too and I liked it, but the new X version is really just fabulous. It's more refined than the last version and clearly is more user friendly. The Air Vape also gets up to temp very fast for vaping on the go. And I like it that you can set the temperature that you want it to hit and also that it vibrates when it's ready to vape in case like I get distracted by chatting or something. You know, it's all like, hey, you know, ready to smoke. That's especially great because you can vape both flour and oil in these. You just slide the little concentrates cup for oil and slide that in and you're good to go. I also dig the travel case that comes with it. It's super sleek and discreet and more importantly, it protects my Air Vape X from getting beaten up or damaged in my pocket or luggage. This is the same vaporizer you heard about in the introduction to the show today. Airvape has given us a few of these to give away to people on our email list. So if you listen to the show, but you're not on the email list, make sure to subscribe for your chance to win one of these vapes this month. You'll also hear more about Airvape a bit later on the show because they bought a commercial spot today. Now, I know you could be thinking that I'm recommending the Air Vape because they sponsor the show, but let me say this. I have five different travel vaporizers at home, but the other four all stay at home. When I go to conventions or to the beach, it's the Air Vape that I grab to take. It's as simple as that. The last product I want to mention is the filter420.com filter for pre-rolls. Because of my asthma, I really got to be careful with pre-rolls. Ever since finding the filter420, I've been able to enjoy pre-rolls a whole lot more. When you attach the recycled plastic filter on the end of the joint, it filters out the tar and gives a much nicer, tastier smoking experience. It is astonishing and actually kind of gross to see all the tar that builds up in one of these filters, and I'm glad it isn't going into my lungs. And it certainly doesn't impede my high at all. That's filter420.com. Again, not a paid ad. So there you are. For today's episode on breathing, I recommend the Vape Exhale desktop vape, the Air Vape X pocket vape, and the Filter 420 pre-roll filter. Check them out. Your lungs will be happy you did. Welcome back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. I'm your host, Shango Los, and our guest this week is breathing specialist Robert Littman of The Breathable Body. So before the break, we were talking a lot about uh, combustion basics, you know, uh, mm-hmm. how, how to breathe, uh, in smoke, what's going on and, and why we enjoy it so much with cannabis. And before we talk vaporizers, I want to talk about what was essentially the old school vaporizer, right? If, if, if we were using a bong and we didn't want it to hurt as much, we added ice. Mm-hmm. And, and for me, that's, that's a good part of college. So, so were we kidding ourselves that that adding ice to the bong um, w- made it easier on our lungs, or did it just make it uh, feel easier because it makes the it makes the experience of the smoke a little less harsh? Well, is there a difference between feeling and and the truth of that experience? It is all based on feeling, and it does cool the smoke. I mean, how many times have you burned your throat? 
And um, it's and when you're burning your throat, it's the same airways that are inside the lungs. And so anything that helps cool it down so that there's not that burn that has to be rehabilitated by the throat and the lungs is going to be advantageous. Right on. So so all of you who put ice in your bongs, thumbs up. And for those of you who live near your, the snow, your snow bongs are still good to go as well. <laughs> right. <laughs> so the thing of the thing about it for using it for for asthma and learning how to. Uh, use your breath properly with the smoke is, you know, you got to stay somewhat conscious. <laughs> yeah, this is true. Um, so, so, as, 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 so while we're still talking about asthma, you know, um, uh, you know, people who listen to the show regularly know that I'm a big fan of vaporizers. I mean, I love smoking, you know, joints and bongs as well when, but, but for daily use, I'm really much more about the vaporizer because, um, because it makes my whole life a little bit better. And the vaporizers that are out now are infinitely better than the ones that we had just a few years ago. But, you know, since you are looking at this as more of a, you know, a science and doctorly direction, how much truth is there actually to the idea that vaporizers are healthier for people generally, but especially for people with breathing issues like asthmatics and CP COPD and things like that? Well, you certainly don't get any of the tars and any of the, any of the burn from the paper. Uh, and it is a, it is definitely a cooler smoke. You're not even going up over you know 170, 180 degrees. While when you're combusting through a pipe or through paper, you can be up to a thousand degrees temperature. So there's quite a bit of difference right there alone. As well as like I said, with especially with papers, you're getting all of, all the um, particulates that are in the papers. So with vaporizers, you don't get any of that. You don't get any of the ash. You're just getting the vapor, and the vapor is carrying the terpenes, and it's carrying the THC. Certainly, experientially, it's it's much nicer to the point that when when I turn people on to my my luxurious vape XL um, water pipe vaporizer, um, th at first they're not even certain if they got a hit mm -hmm. because because they're expecting the the irritation and the and the choking and all of that and <laughs> and, 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 and 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 what they normally just say is oh that tastes good which is of course a, a great response but then by the time they've had their second or third hit and they they've gotten used to the idea that they exhale and it's more of a of a light tasty vapor than it is smoke it, you know people start to get into it at at that point um so what's going on differently in the body is it just simply that the body is not clenching because i'm not smoking in all those extra tars and particulates that you mentioned Yes, that's very true. I like the way you say that because the lungs are very responsive to atmosphere. And so if there's things in the atmosphere like tars and ash, they are going to contract to make sure that they do not absorb those things. And so with vaporizer, there's the, the, it's not going on alert. The body's not going on alert. Right on. Um so the other piece, oh, ahead, is, yeah. the, other, the other piece that I was going to say about it is that you know when you're vaporizing and you you don't think there's much smoke coming out, you kind of have to wait to see what the effects are. Yeah, that's actually a good point. You know, historically, I would judge um, how uh, you know how high I was going to get based on my exhale. Like, so, you know, somebody has a big exhale and it's a big cloud of smoke and everybody in the smoking circle goes, oh, you know, because that person's in for a fun ride. Um, but with, with a vaporizer, I really have to judge it in how much I pack into the vaporizer. Um, because there's there's not that visual cue anymore, and, and certainly when I was learning how, first using how to use a vaporizer, I would... You know, ha you know, both over and under pack until I learned, you know, how to use this new tool. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And remember, too, that we're talking about this from additional use for, you know, we started this conversation around asthma and about body awareness. So slowing it down, cooling the tempers down gives a chance for the consciousness and the awareness to actually pay attention to the process without having to be so reactive. So there's an engagement. You breathe in, you breathe out. And you're kind of sitting with, well, how's this, how's this acting in my body and what kind of medicinal effects is it having right now, especially if I'm using it at a time that my lungs are contracting and having a bit of an asthmatic attack. I want to feel that instantaneous uh, dilation that's, that's possible. And for folks who don't have asthma or COPD, I would think that this would be a winning strategy for them as well, simply because 
you know, for a lot of people, if you take, you know, a monster hit and it has a lot of particulate smoke in it, um, and, and you start coughing, uh, you know, perhaps your adrenals kick off a little bit. Maybe you get a little anxious. Maybe you do get that soreness of the lung going forward. So even if you're just toking for fun, um, using a vaporizer may be to your benefit just because it's an easier experience. Yeah, and one of the things that's, um, that you're speaking to about choking, excuse me, choking and coughing, again, when we go back to what we said earlier in the day about breathing from the diaphragm or breathing from the chest, coughing and choking are all energies that come upward. And it doesn't take the body long to get patterned into a different breathing pattern. So if you cough and choke for a little bit, you'll probably notice right away, the next couple of breaths, you're up in your chest. So then you have to be conscious about bringing your breathing back down to the lower part of the body. So if you're vaporizing easily and taking small hits on it, you can kind of stay with that experience as you begin to deepen into your breathing. So, so this next question, I, I, I don't know if you're going to have an answer for this, Robert. It's, it's definitely non sequitur, and I haven't seen any studies on it, but I'm going to ask it anyway because um, you've already surprised me a couple times. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, when pe some people, when they first start vaporizing, they say that the high is different than when they're smoking joints. And, <laughs> and you know, after doing a lot of both and having a lot of, using a lot of different kinds of vaporizers, I have to agree with that to a certain extent. Um, certainly, I can get just as high from a, a vaporizer as I can from a joint, but somehow the the tenor of it is different. It's it's a little it's a little cleaner. It's a little less violent. Um, but but um, I don't really know why it's, th th there's a difference. I suspect. It's because there are attributes to the experience of the high that people feel after smoking a joint that, that they don't feel after a vaporizer. So I don't know if that was a very well-worded question, but if you understand where I'm going, what are your thoughts? Well, I do, I do understand where you're going. That's my experience as well. But I, I'm really about uh, engagement and participation with an experience. And I find that I can be more – I do notice that I – you know. It is a different kind of high. I would say I don't feel as high, but I'm not sure that's exactly accurate. But I do feel like I, I'm not engaged. My body's not engaged with having to filter out the negative attributes of smoking. So I can stay more connected to the experience. That's my best answer for that. And that's the part that I like. I like being engaged with the process that I'm uh, participating in and I like being engaged with my awareness that I stay present in my body and in my experience. I don't like getting so far out that I have to manage too many different um, experiences at one time, being high and clearing my throat, and all those different pieces. I think the body, what we're not aware of is that the body is on alert in some way that takes us out of the immediate enjoyment of the experience. I like that answer. Good. I'm glad I asked. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, you know, a, a lot of these folks who are listening, a lot of folks that listen to the show work with COPD patients like I do. Um, and, and a lot of folks talk about COPD patients, but I, I have a feeling that people don't really get what's up with that condition as much as they do with asthma. So will you just describe what COPD is uh, just so for everyone's understanding. Well, COPD stands, first, first of all, the initials stand for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So something's happening in the airway, so obstruction. So over time from asthmatics, that's where it usually develops from. It's, it's, a, it's an order of you know, allergies, asthma, COPD, emphysema, where the airways are so uh, occluded or tightened and twisted that it's hard to get the air, move air in and out, as well as what's beginning to happen is that the little air sacs in the lungs, there's 300 million of those little air sacs that get move air back and forth. I just like this little statistic. If you cut them open and lay them side by side, it's a, you have a surface area of a tennis court to move air back and forth. Oh. So those little alveoli start to um, distend and they lose their elasticity. And the blood vessels that are picking up oxygen around those alveoli start to separate a little bit. So the movement of air and oxygen is, is hindered. We can't get as much oxygen. We're not as saturated as much. So uh, the 
where we go with this with COPD, it is really important that breathing rhythms and breathing volumes and the balancing of the blood gases that are available are at their optimal. So even if we're getting less oxygen than normal, we are able to move it to our cells. That's the issue. It's not just that what we can take in, what's in our blood, but how does it get from our blood into our cells where it does the most good in making the energy that runs our body. So COPD is a very debilitating energy-wise. We bodies don't have enough energy to operate fully unless they get supplemental oxygen or learn how to breathe really in the most effective way to minimize the reduction of not moving the, that's too many negatives, of not moving the oxygen from the blood to the cells, but maximizing that potential. So I run into patients all the time asking me about cannabis as a bronchial dilator and they want to vape it. Um, But when I originally started hearing this from people, I thought that was crazy, right? Because with COPD, why would you want to inhale anything? And then I went ahead and I started looking at the studies and, 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 and there's, there seemed to be a mix. Some to, some suggest that you want to Um, inhale cannabis vapor so that you are directly applying it to the lungs for the bronchial dilation and general relaxation effects. But then, but then some talk about uh, the potential use of oral tinctures too, which would be more systemic and, and, and not targeted towards the lungs. So, so what are your thoughts about the, the benefits of taking a cannabis tincture and their ability to bronchial dilate the lungs without actually inhaling the vapor? For This is for more severe COPD folks who are looking for relief. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of the tinctures. I, we, we could say a couple, two things that I'm thinking about right now. It depends what's going on COPD-wise, whether there's something, some kind of obstruction that's going on in the lungs themselves or whether it's in the airways going towards the lungs. So we have to kind of take a look at what's going on. If, there's more, if the damage is more um, systemic in the lungs, then I like tinctures. And so a lot of the studies that have been done are tinctures are a good way to go. That is the oldest form of taking cannabis. Even in Egypt, in ancient times, they used tinctures in India and China. When you're thinking about bronchiodilating for asthma or for COPD, it would be more effective to do that when you are having a moment when you really are bronchioconstricted. The vape will get to it much sooner. If you're just trying to keep the airways open and relaxed, then tinctures will do the job. But if you want, if you're having an attack and really can't catch your breath, and there's a, you're not able to move any air, the tinctures are too slow. So you need to vape in that particular time. I get it. So, so taking a tincture is more of a preventative, and 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 vaping is more like crisis management. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. So, mm-hmm. so before we go to our second commercial, I want to create this opportunity because um, uh, when I met with you, you went through this wonderful little breathing exercise, and um, I think that everybody would would appreciate having this experience. So, so we're talking about asthma, we're talking about COPD, we're talking about taking taking too big of hits, and we're talking about crisis management. And and all of these can be answered by creating a soothing breathing pattern. And, um, and, and this example is, is you teach this on your, on, on your YouTube channel as well. So if, if, if people hear this, you know, once in your car with the podcast and you want to hear a longer version of it, you can, you can get that on, um, the breathable body website and on his YouTube page. But, but would you, this is, this is a short thing. It's only about 90 seconds, but, but Robert, would you go ahead and do the soothing breathing pattern, um, exercise for folks? And then, and then after everybody's all chill, we'll go to commercial okay do i have a little time for a little backstory on this yeah yeah go right ahead okay so we've been talking about nose breathing a little bit so let me just say a couple of things that nose breathing is the the way the body uses air most effectively you breathe through your mouth as often as you eat through your nose is what we'd like to say in class and that you pace yourself you can breathe through your nose almost all the time. Why is that? Is because it's the best utilization of carbon dioxide. The body retains more to help the oxygen move. When you breathe through your mouth, you give off way too much carbon dioxide, as I said, in hyperventilating. And we've seen this experience when somebody's about to faint and they breathe in through a paper bag, 
they're breathing back their own carbon dioxide and they reduce the ability to faint or lose the, uh, they won't faint, let's put it that way. So this exercise is designed when you're feeling anxious or when you're feeling like you're breathing too fast in 81 seconds, how to bring the body back to a little slower breathing rate as well as to maximize the use of your carbon dioxide to help oxygen get distributed more quickly, which will bring the system back into relaxing. So I'm gonna do this in a 90, 81 second exercise and it's up to the count of six and then back from the count of six. So you'll understand when I do it. If you're having an asthma attack, you would do it up to the count of 10 and then come back from 10. So sit comfortably. I'm going to say it this way. I'm going to tell you to breathe in. I'm going to tell you to breathe out. And I'm going to tell you to suspend your breathing. So I'm having you breathe in um, to the rate of two seconds, out for the rate of three seconds, and then we'll be holding periodically, moving from two seconds up to six seconds and back again. So don't overbreathe. Don't try to breathe harder. Be in a relaxed place. Just let the air come in as naturally as it can in this particular time. Whatever your breathing rate is and rhythm is, let it be that. Don't overdo it. All right, here we go. So when I say ready, take a breath in, take a breath out, and suspend your breathing. One, two, take a breath in, take a breath out, and suspend. One, two, three, take a breath in, Take a breath out, suspend, one, two, three, four, breathe in, breathe out, suspend, one, two, three, four, five, breathe in, breathe out, suspend, one, two, three, four, five, six, breathe in, breathe out, suspend, one, two, three, four, five, breathe in, breathe out, suspend, one, two, three, four, breathe in, breathe out, Suspend, one, two, three, breathe in, breathe out, suspend, one, two, breathe in, breathe out. Everybody nice and relaxed now? Yeah, Robert, I am really calm. <laughs> I, am, I am very chill now. Um, yeah. So this feeling that I have right now is why I wanted to include it in today's show, because when we did this in person, um, it actually makes me feel like I'm gently high. Um, and it's just working with my body's natural rhythms. And uh, not only is this great for folks with asthma and COPD and, and related, um, you know, blockage type things, but um, but also... Um, as more and more people are experimenting with cannabis and, and people introduce themselves to dabbing and, and cannabis is getting stronger, um, sometimes we can feel anxious when we're using cannabis. And mm -hmm. so this, this breathing exercise, you know, so far it has been 100% effective in me when I get a little off my game and get anxious when I'm toking. This brings me right back to where I want to be. And for something like that to be so effective and only take a minute and a half of concentration, I would call that some pretty powerful tech. It is. What really what's happening, what the feeling of is, it, you know, all that breath holding in between is increasing the CO2, which is really allowing the body to flood with oxygen. And so that's what you're feeling when you're feeling a little high. You're getting so much more oxygen to your brain. And once the brain has more oxygen, it says, well, okay, we can chill. There's no, there's nothing, there's no threat going on. We're, we're fully fed. We're nourished. Fantastic. So uh, let's go ahead. I'm so calm now. Let's go ahead and, and, and take our, uh, our second break, and we'll be right back. Uh, you're listening to Shaping Fire, and my guest today is breathing specialist Robert Littman. While I certainly still enjoy smoking joints, I moved over to using vaporizers about three years ago. 
The high was a little different than burning the flower, and in the end I decided I preferred it for daily use, especially because I have asthma. More importantly though, I could taste my flower so much more. It's hard to express to you how significantly different cannabis with a good terpene profile tastes when vaped instead of burned. I have brought my vape with me to visit growers, and they are astonished by the clarity of taste, and they say they feel like they're tasting their flower for the very first time. The Air Vape Vaporizer from AirVapeUSA.com is a great device to use on the go or at home. When you pick it up, it feels satisfying like a medical device. It isn't flimsy like many vapes are. I like how the flower is inserted in the top instead of the bottom, so it travels a shorter path to my mouth. With the cannabis at the top, I get a hit that feels more substantial, even though I'm just inhaling vapor and not full-bodied smoke. Since I use this vape for flour, hash, and concentrates, I really like that the digital control for the temperature is right there on the front. Three clicks of the button and it fires up to the temperature I specify really quickly and discreetly. You know, vape concentrates are a milder experience than dabbing, but you still get the potency in your hit. Also, the taste is great, as would be expected with a low temp dab. I love that this vape gives quick little vibrations when it gets to the right temperature. That way, if I'm chatting or distracted while it's heating up, it lets me know when it's ready. If you are ready for a nice pocket-sized vaporizer, consider the AirVape. The new AirVape X has just come out and it's gorgeous and it includes many updates. You can find more about the AirVape vaporizer at airvapeusa.com. If you own a cannabis company, you know that finding good business partners, vendors, and allies is an essential part of your role. And building your business in a new industry like cannabis doesn't always make that easy. Canacon is coming to Boston and Detroit this summer, and the halls will be filled with every kind of ally you need for a cannabis company. Technology, horticulture, packaging, marketing, legal human resources, and media, everything you need for your business will be there. And your customers will be there, too. Because Canacon is a premier cannabis business and networking event with nationally recognized speakers and the opportunity to have serious conversations with your business peers and investors. Reserving yourself a booth at Canacon can unlock a lot of doors for you. Not only do you get to network with all the people who pass your booth, but it is not uncommon for Canacon vendors to do a million dollars in business during the event. Canacon Seattle event in February sold out well in advance, so reserve your booths now for Detroit, June 1st and 2nd, and Boston, July 27th and 28th. Attendee tickets are still available for both events. Whether you reserve a booth or attend just for a day, do not miss the opportunity to become a serious player in your market. Visit Canacon.org for tickets, booth reservations, and more information. That's Canacon.org. Welcome back. You're listening to Shaping Fire. I'm your host, Shango Lose, and our guest this week is breathing specialist Robert Littman of The Breathable Body. So I got to tell you, that was one of the calmest breaks I have ever had. In, in fact, I needed to do a couple jumping jacks to get my head back in the game for this last section. So uh, during this last section, we're going to talk a bit about um, uh, dabbing and then uh, a bit about uh, uh, ceremonial plant medicine. So that'll be fun. Um, but let's let's talk, we'll talk a little bit about what we know so far about breathing and dabbing because, because you know, most of these studies around the impacts that dabbing has on the human um, just haven't been done yet. Uh, um, there's a gr lot of opportunity there, but they just haven't been done yet. So, so let's start with something really basic. So the, the heat coming off of dab rigs is extraordinarily hot, um, especially if someone's using a torch and if they hit it at a full temp. You know, you know, Robert, is, is, is dabbing especially abusive to the lungs compared to other types of, of inhalation of cannabis? Yeah, it feels that way to me. I mean, it's the burn. If we're getting, again, I go back to the burning issue. The burning issue is is going to cause the the lungs and the airways to to scar. So over time, uh, the repetitive tearing apart of the epithelial lining, rebuilding the epithelial lining, tear it down, rebuilding it, it's going to come. To, you know, the body is very adaptable in terms of strengthening what it needs to strengthen, and it will just solidify some of those more malleable tissues that are meant to be malleable. And so, you know, over time period, that's a stiffening of the airways, not what's meant to happen. Yeah, that doesn't that doesn't sound good. Certainly, it doesn't feel good. It's it is an odd part of of cannabis culture right now. And and you know, and I should say up front that that I dab. You know, I'll, I I dab using uh, butane torches when I'm out. But really, I prefer dabbing at home on my on my Vapexel um, 
device, but you know, I dab, so I'm, I'm into concentrates, but what I'm not into is that burning feeling. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, it, it seems to me that, that, uh, it's a, it's an odd aspect of our cannabis culture that, uh, the burning and even sometimes people keeling over from the, from the amount of, of, you know, things that they inhaled calling it husband they keel over there's a certain amount of you know hero-ness to having that big hot dab <laughs> and i i think that we're gonna we're gonna evolve away from that as a scene and and for me the uh, the sooner the better how about the inhalation of terpenes though um you know smoking a joint is one thing because there's o only so many terpenes to inhale in the joint but with a concentrate you know those are could theoretically reach a level of terpene toxicity you know and i and i have yet to see any studies on this so so, so it's it's mostly just opinion. But like, what's your hunch as somebody who does this all day every day? What do you think that the studies are going to look like when when they're eventually completed? I, I do think there'll be toxicity. I think I think of it the terpenes as aromatherapy. You know, and you're, and you're doing some aromatherapy. You're always looking for the light, uh, the light smell, and you know you you're going to eventually um, become more immune to the to the. To the terpenes themselves, the body is going to develop a, a, a protection device so they won't be as effective. That's my hunch. Yeah, that makes sense. And you know, it, it also makes me concerned about these these custom sauces that people um, are putting into vape pens. I mean, anybody who listens to the note into the show knows that I'm a big fan of. Uh, uh, of whole plant medicine anyway, but some of these, you know, these custom terpene sauces people are, are making, um, they are being blended based on taste more than they're being blended based on science. Mm. And it concerns me that some of these especially tasty carts that are jam packed with aftermarket terpenes that don't come you know, that, that are not in the original makeup of the plant, the percentage of them are so high, so they taste good. Uh, I'm just concerned about their long-term effects of the lungs. And I know that that could make me sound like a, like a negative Nelly or whatever, but you know, as somebody who works with patients every day, this is, this is where my head's at. No, you, you're answering your own question. I mean, it's an artificial stimulation. It's just, it can, human body doesn't like that kind of stuff. It just doesn't. Right on. So, um, so, so let's, let's up the scales, right? So, so when someone takes a huge dab, they are inhaling heavy amounts of, uh, you know, THC and other cannabinoids, intense terpenes. And I've seen plenty of videos and, you know, people even joke about this online in memes where someone takes a huge hit and keels over, right? Their, their eyes are rolling back a little bit. Maybe they shake and they fall mm -hmm. over. And, you know, in some circles, their friends laugh and, you know, that's, that's just, that's part of our, seen here um but but why right like what is happening with the delivery of that hit to the lungs that somehow shuts their human down how come it doesn't happen to other people you know doing entertainment size dabs of several grams for a video it only seems to happen to some people sometimes when they take a monster hit do you have any suggestions about what might be going on at the the mechanization level you know all each each one of us is sensitive in a different way. And so some people can tolerate pain, some people can tolerate uh, loud noises, and some people can. So it depends on a person's nervous system. The shutdown is an overload. The body, can, the nervous system is going, I can't handle this, I gotta shut down. It's too much, it's too much stimulus way too fast for this particular nervous system. And so it shuts down. Well, that would make sense why it's different for, for every people and, and probably even why um, it's probably also related to tolerance, too. If, uh, mm -hmm. it, you know, over time, you can probably handle more dab inhalation than you would sense. a normal eyes. But, you know, I'm thinking back to the, the second set. You know, it's actually, a, a, you know, well said that if people are going to dab, because I'm going to continue to dab, even though I know what we're talking about. But, but what I have found is that, um, micro dabbing is the way to go. Um, hmm. because just like we were talking earlier about, um, the, the very clear reasons why it makes physiological sense to take more smaller hits, um, because you are, 
uh, you, you, you'll be gentler on the lungs. Plus, honestly, you're, you're preserving your, your uh, cannabis as well because you're not wasting it on the exhale. Um, but, but taking more, like a higher number of micro dabs, so you're taking more of a smaller inhalation really seems to be the way to go if, if you're going to, if people are going to continue with concentrates, which they're, they're, you know, it's just getting more popular, not less. Well, we come back to the topic of the show, which was asthma and COPD. So you have, kind of have to evaluate when the micro dab does its job for you for that particular person, for that particular reason. If you're using it for other things, like to party and have a good time, that's a different story. But otherwise, the studies that have been done show about 200 micrograms of THC is all you need for the bronco for the uh, lungs to begin to expand. So, uh, you know, it's overkill. Uh, in terms of that regard, so um, yeah, I think I think I think of it in terms of alchemy that we're we're experimenting at both ends, from microdosing to dabbing, to trying to come to some middle middle ground that says this is what's really best for the body. As we now it's becoming you know so pervasive, it's legal almost everywhere. We didn't have that opportunity. It's like we're we're in a candy store now, trying to figure out what the, what's the best candy to use. Yeah, right. And 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 we want we want to experiment with all the candy without suddenly getting obese or having a sugar fit. Right. <laughs> yeah, totally. So, uh yeah, interesting. Uh we're, the, a lot of us are learning in the mix, especially those of us in the industry who are developing these products at the same time as we're learning how to use these products. I remember the early days of dabbing you know, the, the same people who were dabbing were the ones who were doing the, you know, the, were the first extractors. And so they were their own guinea pigs, which I see a lot in this mm. industry. I mean, heck, um, I, I, I experiment myself with new techniques. And I'm like, well, was that a pleasant experience? You know, did, did this CBG tincture work to help with my back pain or not? And, um, and it's, it's interesting how many of us in the industry are our own guinea pigs. Well, I think the word you used there was pleasurable. Was this pleasurable or not? That's not something that we really as a culture of value is what's pleasurable. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we can do with cannabis, especially in microdosing or, you know, being gentle with ourselves, is to really find out, is it giving us the results that we want? And does it feel pleasurable to me? Why don't I want something that feels pleasurable? Why don't I want something that's going to burn me? Well, the, the, the pleasure principle there is uh, something that is a great transition for our last topic because, you know, one of the things that I've enjoyed uh, hearing you speak and, and, and watching your, your videos is that, you know, you really blend science, uh, ceremonial plant medicine, and experienced-based spirituality together when you're teaching people, you know, not only how to take care of their body with breath, but also people who are interested in, you know, ceremonial plant medicine uh, as part of that health experience. So, you know, tell us a little bit, if you would, why smoking cannabis can be so spiritual with the right set and setting. Well, I, I, a friend of mine um, kind of introduced me to this idea about speaking to the plant itself, to uh, Santa Maria, Mary Jane, however you want to call her, and recognizing that she's an ally, that she's a teacher. And in that teaching, she will go through many stages when you ingest her. You know, it's the first rush of her, and then there's the long period of her enlivening you in some kind of spiritual body way. And then the piece that comes afterwards where you begin to come down from it and you feel your tiredness and your end of your journey. So you're thinking of it as a journey, as a time period of in, ingesting an ally who is on board to wake up some part of your consciousness. For me, it's mostly body consciousness, but I also like when I am moving my body, how it enlivens my psyche and my spiritual consciousness. So being conscious that it is an ally, that's the best way I can say it. And so many plants, like other plants, are master teachers, but um, cannabis has its own, um, its own textures and personality. So, you know, really engaging with the personality of the plant that you're ingesting allows it to enhance what you're wanting to bring forward in that particular moment. And different strains will do different things. So um, there again comes back to the engagement and being intelligent about what am I using this for and what do I hope to get out of it? And let me use the plant in a way that will support that. 
one of the things that I find interesting is that, you know, we have an ability to look at our inhalation of the cannabis plant in very um, specific analytical techniques now because we've got we've got laboratories and microscopes and things like that. Whereas if you look back 10 or 20,000 years, um, you know, early humans who were carrying this plant around with seeds around with them from from encampment to an encampment and selectively hybridizing just based on on what seeds they took with them um they didn't know the analytics like we do but they knew something moving and important was going on where where during the first set you were talking about how the the inhalation of cannabis makes us more aware of our body and kind of expands our connectedness to the world around us and mm-hmm. and, and for us you know we can we can actually explain that what's going on in the brain you know and and, and what parts are are being um, stimulated and we can look at it uh, with an MRI but anthropologically looking back that far it was much more filled with with mystery and myth and storytelling and you know engaging with you know gods and angels you know what you know how whatever whatever <laughs> the religion of that part of the world was right mm-hmm. um do you think that there is still a place for that kind of 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 experienced based spirituality in a modern world where everything is so data and analytics heavy? Yeah, I absolutely do. I think that uh, one of the things that cultures have been doing since the beginning of time is altering consciousness. And that's what you're doing when you're ingesting, you're, you're ingesting cannabis. You're, you're inviting an altering of consciousness for perception. What do I not see in normal consciousness that I can see when I ingest con- a cannabis that can inform how I live in my normal world? more in touch with my feeling part of my reality than my thinking part of the reality and what magic shows up not like magic as you know something that's just a game but the magic of the mystery it's like wow i'm tuning into something that i've never tuned into before so people are doing ceremonial cannabis um evenings now where that is the focus what what can i bring forward that i normally don't talk about that i normally don't see that i need to process to help me feel more multi-dimensional we are living in a multi-dimensional reality and that's what the fear of it in the government is is like they don't want us to feel what else might else be out be out there that feels more human than not well, may we all tune in and uh, get more attention to the natural world and our own bodies. Thanks for thanks so much for being on this show, Robert. Your your perspective is very unique, and uh, I appreciate it. And I'm glad that you were willing to join us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here, and I've enjoyed the conversation immensely. You can connect with Robert Littman through his website at thebreathablebody.com. And there, there's a link there, but also, uh, you know, make sure you check out his YouTube page. You can just search Robert Littman and it'll come right up. Um, uh, because the videos there give, uh, you know, some more exercises, some more just general explanation of, of breathing. And, uh, and if you tend to get, uh, your nasal passages tend to be clogged up because you because you toke so often. There's a really great exercise there for opening those up nearly instantaneously. You can find more episodes of the Shaping Fire podcast and subscribe to the show at shapingfire.com and on Apple iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. If you enjoyed the show, we'd really appreciate it if you'd leave a positive review of the podcast wherever you download. Your review will help others find the show so they can enjoy it too. On the Shaping Fire website, you can also subscribe to the weekly newsletter for insights into the latest cannabis news and product reviews. On the Shaping Fire website, you will also find transcripts of today's podcast as well. For information on me and where I will be speaking, you can check out shangolos.com. Does your company want to reach our national audience of cannabis enthusiasts? Email hotspot at shapingfire.com to find out how. Thanks for listening to Shaping Fire. I've been your host, Shango Los. 